Yeah. Here's something. How's that? How about I use my uh, lecture voice for this? There you go. Oh, all right. Well, that's all right. Okay. Thank you very much to uh, Rahir Minkhorst for a uh, very enlightening lecture. This is the path to the future. And so especially for the students here, keep your eyes open. You're going to be getting, uh, getting some interesting views of the universe. We have some time for questions. Sure, please. Questions. I can't see all the hands, so speak. Please speak out. Yeah. Shield. Shield. How is that going to get uh, through all the, the, the bars? Ah, yeah, the micrometeorites. So the, the rate of these is on a table this size over. Um, you can actually see it in the Smithsonian. If you go to Washington D.C. in the Air and Space Museum, the old white field camera too that had been in space about that size with a titanium shield. There's maybe about 100 pock marks over 16 years, but most of them are so tiny that they didn't go to the titanium. The uh, Kapton sun shield, which is made from glorified saran wrap, that stuff is so strong that if you send a particle through there, either in a high energy cosmic ray or just a micrometeorite, um, it will go straight through. And so long, as long as you don't have too many and they're not too large, um, it will not be ruinous for the performance of either the telescope or the sun shield. Now, so over 16 or 22 years, the Hubble instruments in orbit have not ever undergone a catastrophic failure. They have had bombardments, but most of these particles are so tiny, they are you know, far smaller than a millimeter, even smaller than 100 microns, that they would not uh, cause a global cat cat catastrophe. They would cause some local damage. So the sun shield is just basically designed to take these heads and it will go straight through. Um, and over the five or 10 year lifetime in that order, we expect to have many, but not so many that the sun will regularly shine through all the holes that you made in the five successive sun layers so that the sun actually shines directly on your secondary mirror, according to the calculations that shouldn't happen too often. Yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? So in the back the, there. Uh, the long design and build cycle, how much does the technology or the detectors suffer from being... Ah, yeah, excellent, excellent question. So the Hubble Wide Field Camera 3 um, detectors were changed a year before launch, and that was just as well because the ones we had earlier on weren't so good. We could have flown them, but the images that you saw here would have not been nearly as good as they are today. The same has happened for James Webb. The budget overrun uh, happened in, in 2010, 2011 for different reasons. They were managerial, and unfortunately they got fixed, but, so that's the good part. The good news of the overrun is that it also gave us a few more years to replace the infrared detectors that was not originally planned for, but it's good in hindsight that we did, because the ones we originally had um, decayed in the lab. We didn't know that they would. They were the same generation as the last ones made for Hubble, and they will not decay in vacuum. But once you expose them to air, there's a certain chemical process that I can't talk about here, but that happens to the uh, layer of the infrared detector that basically makes the material deteriorate. So for Hubble White Field Camera 3, the infrared channel, we never had this problem. For James Webb, we did, but we also now had Rockwell Teledyne in Thousand Oaks, California, make a new generation of these in the last few years that were recently dis delivered this last year, and they're truly outstanding, and those are the ones that are going in. That costed a few million dollars, but on you know an $8 billion project, that's just the price you pay. You want everything to work right, so thanks for asking. Other questions? In the back, Let's see the hand there. Yeah, the lady over here, and then in the back for Drew. Yeah, go ahead. Will the Hubble telescope be maintained after they launch the new Webb telescope? Um, there will be no further shuttle flights unless a miracle happens. Um, so th there is no plan to refurbish it, unfortunately. You could perhaps go up there with two Soyuz capsules and send astronauts and equipment out, but you know, that's politically too hard. And too expensive and that's not being contemplated. The good news is the last mission in 2009, which is now more than five years ago, had all these spare parts, including white field camera three put in, and they're all spec for five years and they still work fine. We've lost one out of six gyros, you know, knock on wood, but we still have five good gyros left. So we'll probably operate for another five, six years. So there may actually be some overlap in time between James Webb. Let's say you find your glorified exoplanet with James Webb and you make terribly important discovery, but you want to confirm something in the blue with Hubble that only Hubble can do, you can possibly still do it. 
Yeah, good question. Other questions? Uh, Drew, and then a hand over here. Well, I happen to know that he brought a beautiful three-dimensional data set with him, and I hope Dr. Williger will give him about two minutes to show that off. Yes. Yeah, yes. but I want to take the last question. I don't want to make sure. Yeah, go ahead. How many telescopes or other objects are in orbit in those Lagrange points around the Earth? Uh, not too many. First of all, the Lagrange point is, is, is a, uh, an unstable Lagrange point. It's not like parabola ones. Once you throw a marble in there, it sinks to the bottom. It's like a, a horse's saddle. If you put a marble in the middle, it will sort of stay there, but you wobble it a little bit, it will fall away. And, and, and therefore, if you don't correct the orbits with a little bit of propellant, we have about 300 kilograms of propellant on orbit, which is enough for 11 years, sort of the maximum lifetime. We will be able to stay in Lagrangian point, but because it's an unstable Lagrangian point, there are so few things out there. The few satellites they launched there, uh, WMAP, which I believe is no longer working, Planck, which is still working, Herschel, which is no longer working. They'll just drift away when they're done. They'll start orbiting the sun like the Spitzer Space Telescope. So it'll become another Earth, but in a slightly different orbit. <laughs> yeah, question? That is only in red. It works only in the red, yes. Uh, be a Hubble too, maybe. Blue. Excellent question. Yes, there will be. And uh, I don't know whether I brought slides here. In this and should I put, pull up a slide from tomorrow's talk here? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, then I need to get all technical here. Forgive me. Uh, no. What now? Um, Hubble blue, ultra blue. Yes. Either one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't do this at home. But I'll go all the way to the end. It's a little slow. I don't know why it's so slow. It's not doing what I wanted to do. <coughs> or maybe it's what's happening. This is the talk, but it's not going to the page I want. Something is fishy. So well, you just have to look at this one then. Um, that that's what we are building on the ground. N not me, but uh, other folks led by Carnegie, Pasadena, also Chicago. Uh, University of Arizona, um, seven giant mirrors which fill the space of this dome and, and some more. You know, of course, they're not quite that curved. That's called the GMT. That's done later. This uh, thank you, should have thought of that later. This um, um, this decade, and this comes. This is your super hubble called at last the um, advanced technology large area space telescope. What I don't have here is the relative size of this and that. This is about three times larger, so fill this entire screen if I do it the same size as James. So it's it humongous. It's 16 meters. The perspective yeah. on that third one is yeah. about 20 meters. This dome is 19 meters in yeah. diameter. So that number three telescope is about as big as this planetarium. Yeah. And so that, that's the future. That, that's what the nation is, is making now. There's one in the north, actually two in the north. No, one in the north and two in the south. The Caltech is making one for Hawaii, which has its own aspects of construction. And this one, GMT, goes on Las Campanas, where some uh, folks here, like James LaRoche, have, have observed uh, with the Magellan Telescope. And so this is sort of a super version of that, much bigger. And then that one will also go in altitude. Trust me, there is plenty of space for that. But if that's still a dream, it hasn't been approved by Congress, hasn't even been proposed to the National Academy yet. But if something, God forbid, were to happen uh, to Hubble before the next decadal survey by the National Academy happens in 2020, which is possible, then this will suddenly become a much bigger priority, right? It is the future. And these things can be made. I mean, this technology doesn't come out of the blue. There's other branches of the government that are interested in that. I, I don't know anything about it, except you know, it happens. So you can make them bigger than that. You can make them 16 meters if you like. So yes, th that's certainly the dream we have. Yeah. Other questions? One more? Two more. Yeah, <laughs> One here, and then one in the back. It's in front Uh, because it's, it's easier to make, if you hexagon, you take this table, you saw off the six edges, and you can mosaic as many as you want. You can get them very tight, 
At the same time, you can fold them back. You can take a layer of three, it's sort of like a leather strap. You fold backwards and then you fold it forwards. It's all made out of uh, uh, titanium and carbon fiber, of course, where the beryllium is mounted on. But it, it allows you to get them closer. The, you see, between the circles, there's big holes there. So between each one of these circles, there is you know, triangular holes that let the light through that then cause reflection, like these diffraction spikes you see in the images. Here you have almost none of that. There's tiny little ridges between the hexagons, but other than that, they fill the entire plane. It's a very good question. So the answer is, even though it looks silly to have this hexagonal jagged edge mirror, it fills the entire plane, and therefore your images are nearly perfect. That's a very good question. Other one in the back. Uh, you spoke about a Lagrangian point that was unstable. Are, yes, they, are they all unstable? No, there's, there's five of them. There's L1, 2, and 3, which are, one is between, I believe, the Earth and the Sun. L2 is the other side of the Earth where the Sun is, and then L3 is on the other side of the Sun where the Earth is. And then L4 and L5 are precisely at 60 degree angles, tri trilateral triangles um, with the Earth and the Sun. And, and that's actually a stable Lagrangian point. Now, of course, the Earth doesn't matter much gravitation in the solar system. But this is the Sun, this is Jupiter. The 60 degrees points north and south, the L4 and L5 of Jupiter, have actually piled up quite a bit of garbage, asteroids. We call them the Greeks and the Trojans. And, and, and you know, so those are stable Lagrangian points. We don't go there because there's a lot of junk there. So we don't, we don't want to mess with that. Yeah. Those are stable because Jupiter's so much bigger? No, no, those are stable because of the mathematics. The, the oh. way it works is the, the Earth goes around the Sun and, and Jupiter. And so while you have it, if you ignore Jupiter for a moment, in the Earth-Sun system, it's really a gravitational two-body problem. But the system, the coordinate system, rotates. And therefore, the behavior of any third gravitational particle, like 